Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome again to the Ephesus Sabbath School Table. We're so happy that you're here to join us this morning for another powerful lesson. We'll be talking from the topic, New Covenant Sanctuary. But before we get started, I want to introduce you to our panel. We have our senior pastor, Pastor Lawrence Brown. Good morning, beloved. I greet you in Jesus' name, and I encourage you, yea, even urge you to embrace every blessed piece of this Sabbath day today. Don't leave a piece of blessing behind. Get it all. Soak it up like, like gravy in a biscuit and let God bless your heart <laughs> abundantly today. <laughs> and we have our first elder, Elder Al Stewart. Happy Sabbath, everyone. May God bless us as we enter into his worship. And I don't want to get hungry before it's time. <laughs> Let's continue to feast on God's word. Amen, amen. Elder Stewart, can you pray for us to start? Sure. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for your many blessings towards us, sparing our lives during the past, this past week, for bringing us to another blessed Sabbath day. And Lord, as we enter into your word, O oh Lord, and we see the covenant promises that you have made for us and the opportunities that we have to partake, Lord, of the promises that you have in these covenants for us. Bless us as we enter into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. 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 So today we're going to be discussing the topic, New Covenant Sanctuary. And again, we want to hear from you. So as we go throughout the lesson, please send all of your questions and your comments to Sabbath School Table at Ephesus.org. So the memory text for this morning is taken from Hebrews 9, verse 15. And it says, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance. This Hebrews 9, verse 15. So my question to you, Elder Stewart, and we touched on this last week. We were talking about the new covenant and the old covenant. What do we mean by the new covenant? And was there something wrong with the old covenant? Well, uh, it's interesting that you ask that question just to lead out because <clears throat> in the, uh, uh, the, the King James Version uh, of uh, Hebrews 9, 15, it talked about the New Testament and the Old Testament. And basically what we have here in the Old Covenant, we are seeing Jesus prefigured, the sacrifice that he was going to make on Calvary's cross for each and every one of us. And in faith, by participating and by practicing uh, and doing the, uh, the sacrifices that uh, was pointing to that, it was an imperfect way of illustrating the sacrifice that Jesus was going to make. And so, when Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, he was the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God that died on the cross for you and for me. And he is the high priest that takes his blood into the sanctuary. But the sanctuary, not on earth, is the sanctuary in heaven, which uh, the one on earth was just a copy. Mm -hmm. And that was an imperfect uh, copy as it were, because the, the, the one in heaven is the most per is, is the perfect copy. And as a result of that, Jesus Christ, our high priest, the spotless Lamb of God, the one that doesn't need a sacrifice for himself on the Day of Atonement to go into the most holy place, is in heaven right now mediating for us so that when we sin and confess our sins to him, what he is doing, he's taking and says, my father, my blood, my blood. And now what we have is our sins taken away from us and his righteousness, righteousness given to us. And before God, we are now perfect, righteous, and are candidates and citizens of the kingdom of heaven, of eternal life. So the New Testament and the New Covenant is the perfect, uh, it, was the, it was the genuine, whereas the old was was prefigured in sacrifices for animals with animals and and and, and an earthly priest and that earthly priest was a sinner himself so therefore the once we have the most perfect one mm -hmm. it replaced the old one but it was the same essentially the same covenant it's the same covenant but now we it's the, the we have the genuine as opposed to the um uh the copy. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Pastor Brown, in the memory text, it says, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, which um, Elder Stewart explained the concept of the new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Who are the those who are called? Like, what does that mean? Right. That is, that is an excellent question because the Bible says 
Uh, many are called, few are chosen. And when the Bible says many are called, uh, that is the most literal uh, way to use it because everybody is called. Now the problem is many choose not to respond to the call and so consequently they are not chosen. And there are some who respond but then they're not faithful so they're not chosen. Um, but here where it says uh, those who are called, the Bible is trying to let us know salvation is available for everyone. If, if, if you miss heaven, if you are lost, it's because you got stuck on stupid and just won't get out your own way. Because Jesus has made provision for everybody to make it. Mm -hmm. So here, where the verse says, to those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, he's trying to say, listen, listen, look in the mirror. You see the person looking back at you? I called you. Now you're going to respond and accept this offer of salvation, pardon, blessing, and mercy? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to, you know, give in to all the foolishness and all the lies and all the conspiracy mm -hmm. theories floating around here, keeping you from, from moving forward? What, what are we going to do? What, what, we do what, what, what are we doing? What, what, what kind of party? What, what are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> so that's the memory verse letting us know we need to get in while the getting in is good. Amen, amen, amen. amen. We're going to go on to Sunday's lesson, and again, we want to hear from you, so please send all of your questions and your comments to Sabbath School Table at Ephesus.org. And Sunday's lesson is entitled Relationships. There was a saying um, at Chase, when I used to work for Chase, they had a slogan that said, the right relationship is everything. Yes. So we're going to learn about relationships. So I want to read for you Leviticus 26, 11, and 12. It says, and I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Mm -hmm. So, Elder Stewart, when we read this text, what does this text reveal to us about what relationship means to God, and why is that so important? You know, uh, God is a relational God, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? Uh, look at the Godhead. We have God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? They are one, but they're still three distinct. And so when God made us, he designed each and every one of us uh, to have relationships. And evidence of that is when we see, uh, for instance, someone to punish and they're in prison. And when they're in prison, if they have committed infractions in prison, part of the pun extra punishment is putting them in solitary confinement. So we, what we see here is that we are designed to have relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the most perfect relationship that we can ever have is to have a relationship with our designer and our creator. We don't know what we're missing by not having a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. So what it says here, God is saying, listen, I know how I created you. I know how I built you. And I know wh how you're going to be. It's like a car. If you want to get the maximum out of that car, then what needs to happen is that you're going to have to operate it according to the manual. And God is saying to each and every one of us, if you want to have the maximum enjoyment and, and, and benefit out of life, it's going to be having one with me because I'm your creator. And so what we see here, God is saying from the very beginning, he says, I will set my tabernacle among you. And that's where that copy of his heavenly sanctuary is. Mm -hmm. And he's telling the children of Israel, they had no, no concept of who God is because of over 400 years in slavery. And God is saying, listen, I want to live among you. And I, when I live among you, I want you to know that I'm your God. And I want you to know that you are my people. You know, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. Because if that happens, the benefits are basically out of this world. Amen, amen. And Pastor mm -hmm. Brown, when we think about this relationship, what is required for the relationship to exist? Mm -hmm. There's got to be contact, and there's got to be, uh, <coughs> you know, the word I'm looking for. Uh, okay, so imagine, imagine uh, two people fall in love, and then <laughs> one takes a job in Spain, and one takes a job in Brooklyn. Now, that's, that's a whole lot of space between them. And, you know, they can try to maintain a quote-unquote long-distance relationship, you know, talk on the phone and Skype and all that kind of thing. 
But imagine how much better uh, it would be if they both <laughs> were in the same place. So in other words, um, relationships require engagement, they require interaction, and they require that uh, we want to be uh, you know, a, a, a part of it. You, you, you can't be dragged into a kicking and screaming. That's, that's not going to be much mm -hmm. of, a, of a relationship. But here you find God wanting to uh, be around us and us around him. Honestly, honestly, that is why this pandemic has put such a beating on me because you, you get used to interacting <laughs> with people, engaging with people, talking with people, and, uh, you know, we... we we had a lot of that stripped away. And uh, because so many people are uh, vaccine phobic, you, you know, you don't know who, uh, it, just, it just messes up everything. So uh, we need Jesus to come so we can, we can, we can relate again like we need to. <laughs> you know, some of the things you mentioned, Pastor Brown, the interaction, the contact, and also I think communication is key mm -hmm. for a relationship to exist. Why do you think communication with God is so important, Elder Stewart? Well, uh, you can't really build a relationship if you don't communicate. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, one of the death uh, knells of uh, any relationship is lack of communication. communication yeah. And I, I, in, in marriages, we see that that is, a, that is one of the things that will cause marriages to dissolve. So it is with God. Uh, God wants to enter into a, it's like a marriage relationship with us. And that marriage relationship is going to require us to communicate because he has things for us, and we have desires and, 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 and needs and so on. And God's want, it, doesn't, it, it, it isn't that God doesn't know what we need, but he loves to hear us enunciate and clarify and say whatever it is that we need, because then he begins that interaction with us. And, and so communication is key, because our hearts opens to him. And, of course, he will never force something on us. He always wants us to do what? He wants us to uh, uh, allow him to come in, but he comes in by invitation. Mm -hmm. And so communication is key because now what happens is, is that you tell me the desires of your heart, and I will now begin to meet those desires in ways that you may not ever have imagined, which is what we do. You know, we tell the Lord what we want. Mm -hmm. And God knows what we really, really want and need, mm -hmm. what we really need. And when he begins to answer the desires of our heart, we now begin to love him more and more. And because of that, what happens is, is that we, that's where love begins to, be, to, to grow between the two because now I'm meeting your felt needs in ways that you have not imagined. And so that's why communication is so key and so important. Amen, amen. You know, as we spoke about now communication, contact, and interaction, in Exodus 25, verse 8, the mm -hmm. Bible says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Mm -hmm. So, Pastor Brown, why was that building of the sanctuary so important? You know how sometimes we uh, are guilty of treating the sacred as as trivial. The whole idea of building a sanctuary is a visual way to send the clear message to everyone that's looking. This is sacred space because I am a holy God and I am looking to engage you in a particular way. So if you got a call from President Obama and he indicated he was coming over to visit, and you look at your living room and you got, you know, old pizza boxes and smelly socks and everything sitting around, you, you're not going to receive him like that because you'd be embarrassed to do so. And the idea of building a sanctuary is God's way of impressing on his people just how holy this engagement is. And rather than just build a garage, rather than just build a ball field, rather than just build a Wendy's or a McDonald's, he said build a sanctuary. Because in doing that, the mind is impressed. Every way you look in that sanctuary, every aspect of it sends a clear message about the holiness of God. And it has an elevate, or it's designed to have an elevating effect uh, on the heart. 
and through the engagement with the holy, uh, we are empowered to leave the profane behind. Amen, amen. So a question for you, Elder Stewart, for those who are watching, we understand then when God said, well, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. When we think about the sanctuary today, mm -hmm. our literal sanctuary, say Ephesus Church, mm -hmm. does a person need to be in the physical sanctuary to dwell with God or have a relationship with God? Uh, that, that, the answer to that question is, is, is no, but it's also, we're also counseled not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together with like believers because, you know, you get a log and you light that log on fire, it will burn for a while. Mm -hmm. But if you put logs together and light them on fire, it will burn brightly, mm -hmm. burn warmer, bring more heat and can produce more because we tend to help, uh, help each other and, 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 and do more f when we are together. So, yes, God says that our body is, we ought to let him come in because our body is his sanctuary. That's fine. But we, but we ought not to forsake our assembling of ourselves together because that's how we grow in him. You know, I, I can grow in having a personal relationship with the Lord, but I get a lot more when I begin to interact with like believers. So I would not tell anyone to be... Uh, uh, a light onto yourself by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, when we come together, we can be, we can do more for Christ. So, God wanted to come um, and build a sanctuary. Now that sanctuary is us, but He wants us to be together. Amen. Amen. Anything you want to add to that, Pastor Brown? Mm -hmm. You know, um, <laughs> it, it's it's funny how it's funny how this whole thing works. Uh, I've heard people say folks are going to get so used to uh, watching church at home that when we open, they're not coming back. You know, I'm not worried about that. You know, I'm not worried about that. You can sit and watch me on your couch. You can sit and listen to me on your front porch. But if you want one of those good old Pastor Brown hugs, you got to be here. <laughs> and there's just something about fellowship that draws us together. And listen, I'm thankful for all this. Zoom, and I've got a member that calls it Zoom Boom. Um, I'm thankful for all of this, but the reality of the situation is while it's better than nothing, nothing is better than physically being able to worship together and fellowship together and rejoice in the goodness of the Lord together. So, uh, yeah. Amen, amen. We have a comment from one of our viewers. I want to read it for you. This person says, these verses sum up the type of relationship that God wants to have with us. Matthew 22, 37 through 40 says, and he said unto them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, before we go on to Monday's lesson, something I want to touch on on Sunday, in the memory text, Leviticus 26, 11, and verse 12, it says, and I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Elder Stewart, what is the purpose, and what can we take from that aspect of the text? My soul shall not abhor you. When we think about relationships. You know, uh, I would say to anyone, uh, Think of, think of the Lord as this great magnet, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is that if you have the right uh, metal on the other end, what happens when you put that, that uh, magnet that is so powerful? It's going to do what? Attract. Attract it. Attract. Mm -hmm. And God is saying to you that, listen, I'm coming down and I want to, I'm building my house. I want you to have, he's telling Moses, build me a house so that I can come, because when I come, what I will do, if you allow yourself to be that, that metal on the other end, that is going to do what? Bring you together. Now, understand this, uh, and this is, this is my, my view of this, right? And this is this way. They were in Egypt for 400 years mm -hmm. when God made this statement to Moses to give to the children of Israel. And in that society, their gods are always far away, not communicating with mankind, and only certain priests may be able to get a word in for, them, for their God to hear them. Mm -hmm. 
Osiris, all of these different gods. And God is saying, I am the opposite of that. I want to dwell among you. I want to be among you because when I'm, when you, when I'm among you, I want to attract you to mm. myself. That is like the complete opposite mm -hmm. of what they may have thought of who God was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while they were in Egypt because of the, the way the, the Egyptian uh, idol worshiping gods were. They were never individuals. They were never gods that were among the people. They were there. You have to do so much great things just to be able to believe that you can have some kind of audience with them. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, that's not who I am. I want you to know that Build me something, I'm going to be among you, and I'm going to draw you to me. And that's, that's important. Anything and, else, and, Pastor and, Brown? And in keeping with that, there, there's something even sweeter happening here. Mm -hmm. If you think about one of the greatest hindrances to the development of a relationship, it's the thought that you are going to see the real me and decide, eh, maybe not. Here, God is saying, I know who you are. Mm -hmm. I know what's really going on with you. you. You have not fooled me with the facade. You have not faked me out with smoke and mirrors. I know who you are, and I love you anyway. This verse is God's promise that knowing us, he would still love, cherish, and embrace us. Because you know why? It is the embrace of God that empowers us to leave foolishness behind. That's why the Bible says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Here is his promise, I know you and I'll love you anyhow. Amen, mm -hmm. amen. Well, here is a transparent and vulnerable question that came from one of our viewers, and Pastor Brown, you can address it. This person says, one thing that confuses me is how am I supposed to love God more than anything? I find it hard to love him more than my partner or think of him more than my partner. Will I be considered a sinner in God's eyes? Is this something I need to ultimately change? And how do I change it? Okay, so here's the reality of the situation. What we dwell upon is what looms large in our experience. Amen. Sure. And our big challenge today is we do not spend enough time with God for him to actively become the big part of who we are and what we are. And that's why, you know, if you spend more time with Facebook, if you spend more time with, you know, video games, if you spend more time with all these other things, those are the things become, those are the things that become important to you because it's not what you say that makes something as important. It's what you do with it that makes something important. So here's the bottom line. Yes, God needs to be more important to us than anything else. Do you know why? Everything else in this world can break your heart and disappoint you. Mm. You can wake up tomorrow and that person who currently means so much to you could have gotten stuck on stupid and broken your heart in a thousand pieces and never turned around to say I'm sorry. But when you realize that God is altogether lovely, when you realize that so much of who you are, where you're going and what you're doing relies and depends on your active engagement with him, that understanding and that thought process begins to put you physically and mentally in a place where you realize and appreciate what God really is to you. And that gives you a launching pad for loving him like you could love nothing else and for wanting to be with him like you could not want to be with anything else. And the beautiful thing about loving God, his, his love doesn't diminish in our lives the other important things. But when we put God first, the love and the energy that come from that love empower us to keep other areas of our lives in equilibrium. Everything, everything, and I mean everything, has to line up behind and play off the fact that God is all and in all. Amen, amen. And I like to just add to that for the individual who asks the question, it's important to be that vulnerable with God as well. Pray to him and say, you know, God, I want to love you more. I'm not sure how. And he will definitely show you 
how to enter into a loving relationship with him, and you will feel that difference. I mean, the Bible says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. So he will do that. So continue to seek him and be that open and vulnerable with him as well. We're going to go on to Monday's lesson. And again, we want to hear from you. So please send all of your questions and your comments to Sabbath School Table at Ephesus.org. And Monday's lesson is entitled Sin, Sacrifice, and Acceptance. Sin, Sacrifice, and Acceptance. So Elder Stewart, we've been talking about the sanctuary service. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of share a little bit for the sinner back then, what did they literally need to do? in terms of entering into the sanctuary? Like, what was the process? What did they need to do if they sinned? You know, uh, I think God wanted to impress upon them and also upon us that sin causes death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only death, but death to the guiltless one, the one who did not commit the sin mm -hmm. because they had to bring an animal. When I say an animal, it had to be a specific, it could be a, a lamb or a goat, right? Uh, they had to bring it, and it had to be one that was spotless, mm -hmm. had no defects in it, had no, um, no uh, 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 disease or anything on it, mm -hmm. right? So if you were living in an agricultural society, you're talking about something that was of great value to the person. Yes. And so you had to bring something like that. And then you had to be the one to slay the animal. Not someone else, not a butcher mm -hmm. slaying it for you. You had to be the one to shed that, to, 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 to mm -hmm. take the, the, that animal's life. If it was valuable to you, imagine. What it would, how costly that would be. Mm -hmm. And then the priest would catch the blood and take it in and sprinkle it into the sanctuary, transferring your sin. So God wanted man to see this, the, the enormity of how, how costly sin is. And so sin requires a sacrifice. And that sacrifice is not something that you could just dismiss it was going to be something that was going to be of value. And then understand this, it's a bloody, bloody situation, you know. Imagine us today. Uh, I have friends that, that, that tell me they couldn't go fishing, which is something that I love to do. <laughs> and, they, I, and, and they were like, I can't, I, I don't, I wouldn't go fishing because I couldn't catch a fish and then turn around and eat them, right? <laughs> because they're, 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 they're seeing themselves as taking a life. Others have said, well, if I see, one person told me that uh, they saw someone kill a chicken, right? And they couldn't eat it after that. Mm -hmm. So you see how we value life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is saying to each and every one of us, sin is taking a life. And it was prefiguring what Jesus Christ was going to do. So when I see this too, it should have uh, caused someone that was living before Jesus Christ came mm -hmm. to see the enormity and, and, and the costliness of how sin is, that it is deadly. Mm -hmm. And it's not something for us to trifle with, to dismiss, and to move on mm -hmm. because it's costing the life of someone or something that did not deserve to die for something that I did. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I think God wanted us to see the enormity of it and the sacrifice that it's going to take to take it away and give us eternal life. No, that's, that's powerful. Here's a text in mm -hmm. Hebrews 10 verse 4, and we touched on this last week. It says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So here we saw mm -hmm. everything that you explained, Elder Stewart. Mm -hmm. This was a sanctuary practice. They had to kill a spotless lamb, a blameless lamb. And, but this text is now saying that that blood could not take away sin. Mm -hmm. So, Pastor Brown, mm -hmm. so what's the connection then with that sanctuary service yep. and Jesus? Yep. This text is saying that those, the blood of the lamb and the blood that they kill couldn't take away sin. Absolutely. So 
you pick up the paper tomorrow, you open it, and you realize that your favorite shoe store is having a 50 cent off sale, 50% off oh. sale. <laughs> you, you, you are so excited, you grab, your, you, you grab your purse, and out the door you go. You go running down to the store, and you find two, three, four, five, let's get crazy, 10 pair of shoes. And you just, you just, you, you gonna shoe it up today. <laughs> you get to the cash register, and you don't break out cash. You, you break out a little piece of plastic, and what happens is that plastic has the promise of payment. Now, the day you do the transaction, they give you the shoes, and you walk out the store, and yet no money has changed hands. But what that plastic says is there is a point in time coming where you are going to be remunerated for this transaction. And that's why they let you pick up those shoes and walk out the store. They don't tackle you at the door. And they say, wait, where's our money? No, you're not stealing today. No. Um, and, and just so, just so, every time they sacrificed an animal, that animal, just like that plastic, had no power in it, in it but it was the promise of remuneration to come. And so every time you did what God told you to do, you were expressing faith in the fact that one day Jesus, the real money, would show up and in dying, redeem us. That sacrifice was your way of saying, Jesus, sign me up. I want to be on your team because you will pay for me. Amen. Amen. I want to read this statement from Monday's lesson. It says, the Old Testament animal sacrifices were the divinely ordained means for ridding the sinner of sin and guilt. They changed the sinner's status from that of guilty and worthy of death to that of forgiven and reestablished in the covenantal God-human relationship. So this is now sharing with us the sanctuary service, but it's important for us to see, well, what happens next and why was Jesus coming and his role so important. So we're going to learn more about that in Tuesday's lesson. So let's go to Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled The Substitution. And again, we want to hear from you. So please send all of your questions and your comments to Sabbath School Table at Ephesus.org. And I'm going to read this text for you, Galatians 1 verse 4. It says, who gave himself for our sins? that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So we just learned a lot about the sanctuary service, the killing of the lambs, why the sinner had to participate in that, um, the relationship and us understanding the covenant relationship and our role in that as to why the sinner had to participate. But now we want to understand when we spoke before last week about the old covenant and the new covenant, here we are now talking about the substitution. Mm -hmm. So Elder Stewart, mm -hmm. who was the substitution and why was that substitution necessary? You know, I like the illustration that the pastor gave concerning buying the shoes, mm -hmm. getting the shoes, uh, and at some point in the future, you have to settle that debt, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for us, we got all the, you know, the person who bought the shoes got all the benefits of wearing that new shoes. In this case, let's substitute shoes for the promise of eternal life and the benefit that uh, was derived from it from, that, from the point in time that you uh, uh, accepted uh, the, uh, uh, the promise of, of eternal life, right? Because the Lord tells us that from the moment you accept them, you are really living in your in eternal life, and it will be yours eventually to continue on throughout the ceaseless ages. So you are uh, uh, enjoying the benefits of the promise, mm -hmm. and that promise was to the individuals that lived before Jesus came, was that if you do these things, one day when the death is going to be settled, right, it's going to be taken care of and you're free. The substitution was Jesus Christ. Amen. He, if, uh, let me tell you, if you did not ask, if Jesus did not come and die, we would, we would die in our sins. And if Jesus did not die on the cross for you and for me, those sacrifices that were done mm -hmm. with bulls and goats and, 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 and the sanctuary service would, would, have, would have been for naught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would not have satisfied if Jesus decided, 
somewhere, and I'm like, you know what, I'm, ch I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to come anymore. You and I would die in our sins. That's right. Because those animals could not have substituted, could not have pardoned, their blood could not have cleansed us from sin. There had to have been the perfect substitution, the one that could have satisfied that, and that was Jesus Christ. Amen. It was Jesus Christ who had to come and die on, on the cross, the spotless Lamb of God, the one who had no sin, the one who lived the perfect life that we could not live, die for us, and then offer us his perfect righteousness mm -hmm. as a substitute for our sin, sinfulness, and for the sins that we have committed that cause us to forfeit eternal life. You and I forfeited the right to eternal life when we sin. Right. And we could not purchase that, we could not purchase back that which we had, uh, which we lost. So therefore, it's important that there be something that can satisfy that debt. And that debt was Jesus. And that's why he is the substitute. And that's why without the substitution, you and I would be doomed to eternal death without that substitution. And that substitution is Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. I think that really brings us full circle into understanding the reason for the new covenant, Jesus being that substitute. So Pastor Brown, in the text it says, who gave himself for our sins? Was Jesus forced to do this? Did mm. he volunteer? And whatever the answer is, how should that make us feel? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, in one sense, I would say he was forced to do it, not from the standpoint of somebody putting a gun to his head and saying, you better redeem him or else, no, but forced from the fact that he loved us so much, mm. love drives you, compels you, uh, yea, even forces you to do things. And here we find this, this overwhelming love that he has for his creation uh, leading him to uh, die for us. And at the end of the day, that's why the author of the song said, oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. And that's the kind of love that we find on display here um, with a God whose love drove him to die. Amen. You know, Elder Stewart, as I think about the sacrifice and the whole process and Jesus being the substitute, but then God being so powerful, he can do anything. Did blood have to be shed? And why was that? so important. No, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Mm -hmm. Now, um, deep in God's, in the resources of God, he saw that that was what it was required for us to be saved. I'm accepting that by faith, mm -hmm. that without the shedding of blood, and not just any blood, but it had to have been the blood of someone who was equal to the law that was broken. Yep. And that uh, blood that was equal to the law was, was the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, so if, hmm. if, if, if the law is the perfect representation of who God is, mm -hmm. and that, is, that law is broken, and God's, and, and, and you cannot, God is not a, 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 a God perfect. that says, okay, you know, I'm gonna excuse it, right? So because of that, there had to have been something on that same level, mm -hmm. right? as God, yep. that would have to pay the price for what was broken at that level. Mm -hmm. And that was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And his blood spilled on Calvary's cross for you mm -hmm. and for me. So that's why it, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no yeah. taking away of sin that we have committed. So it had to have been the blood of Jesus Christ, and it had to have been his blood, you know. Uh, yep. And so when the plan of salvation was instituted, God saw that that was what was going to be necessary, and Jesus Christ volunteered to be that for us. And because of that, and because of that, we now can accept that. Because when we accept that, his blood now takes away our sins. Mm -hmm. I still look, Pastor Brown's sins have been taken away from him, but if he commit uh, an error tomorrow, I may never forget that, right? But God's blood has taken away that sin yep. from him. And he was covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And in the eyes of God, he is as perfect as any, as, as, as any sinless being could ever be. Amen. And so for that reason, 
this substitution was necessary. Amen. Pastor Brown, is it really yeah. that simple? So for the person who was watching who may have been a murderer, an adulterer, a thief, a liar, a cheat, is salvation that simple mm. for them? You know, uh, as Elder Stewart was talking, uh, I had to chuckle because God is so consistent. There's no shortcuts here. Uh, one of the troubling things you see about politics today is people say, well, when I'm in power, this is how it has to go. When it benefits me, this is how it has to go. But when I'm in trouble, oh, no, 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 no. We, we, we're going we're gonna to make this adjustment. God doesn't play fast and loose with the rules like that. Mm -hmm. And so because he's consistent, because his, his, his law, once it was broken, um, it, it had to be addressed. Mm -hmm. No, you know, pay somebody off. No, ah, we're going to look the other way. You know, I'm laughing because on, on um, I was watching a, a, a news clip, and this lady was giving her neighbor a fit because her neighbor had a Joe Biden sign on her, land, on her lawn. And she's like, you know what the rules say. You know what the rules say. And she's rattling off the rule, the number, and everything. You can't have that kind of sign on your lawn. But here was the funny part about the rant. The woman who was doing all this yelling and screaming, her lawn was covered with Trump signs. Now, hold on a second. If you're going to have a Biden sign, these are the rules. you got to follow the rules. But Trump, I'm not taking my Trump signs out. You can't make me. And I said to myself, now, what if God was like that? Fickle, fickle. No, he's not. And so, and so because he's that consistent, yes, it really is that simple. Because here's what God is saying. The rules work. And the rule is Christ died for me and his substitution. And that's why that word is so important. I told you a few weeks ago I was walking down the street and somebody's Lamborghini was parked there by the sidewalk. Now, how would you feel if I came up, it's your Lamborghini, I came up, took your Lamborghini, and left you with a bicycle? That's no substitution. You just got straight up ripped off. But, but when you talk about a substitution, you're talking about value for value. And so Jesus dying so that you could live, that's value for value. Amen. And so whoever you are, whatever your problem, whatever your transgression, whatever your sin, the blood of Jesus is powerful enough that if you follow the rules, and what are the rules? The rules are, I died that you might live. The rules are, come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. The rules are, we can trade. I'll take your sin, you can have my seven. Those are the rules. And when we follow the rules, they really are just that simple. And whoever you are, you have a shot at eternal life. Mm -hmm because of the rules. Amen. 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 I love what the lesson says here. It says, it is not God's will that you should be distrustful and torture your soul with the fear that God will not accept you because you are sinful and unworthy. You can say, I know I am a sinner, and that is the reason why I need a savior. Hmm. I have no merit or goodness whereby I may claim salvation, but I present before God the all atoning blood of the spotless lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is my only plea. Amen. And that's what it is. So we're gonna move on to Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled The New Covenant High Priest. And again, we wanna hear from you, so please send all of your questions and your comments to Sabbath School Table at Ephesus.org. So we've gone through this journey now of, you explain Elder Stewart, the sinner bringing the spotless lamb, them having to kill that lamb, then the priest taking the blood and administering it through the sanctuary service, and then the substitution of Jesus actually now being that lamb to take away the sins for the entire world. Mm -hmm. But now we see him in another role mm -hmm. as high priest. Mm -hmm. I want to read this text here, Hebrews 8, verse 6. Uh -huh. It says, But now hath he ordained a more excellent ministry, but how much more also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Yes. So th this role as high priest and mediator, what is this text saying to us, Elder Stewart? Now, I want you to go back and let's look at the Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest for that year, he is the one that is going into the, um, 
uh, uh, the most holy place, the first thing that that priest had to do was make a sacrifice for himself, mm -hmm. his family. Mm -hmm. Because if he had any sin in Lord, his life, Lord. and he now were to uh, sacrifice mm -hmm. the lamb for the nation, mercy, right, and entered into the holy place mm -hmm. before the throne of God, he would, have, he would die. Mm -hmm. yep. He would die because he was a sinner. Yes representing the high priest that was going to be officiating in the sanctuary in heaven, right? And so here we see Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb of God mm -hmm. that died on the cross, mm -hmm. is now the high priest that is taking his blood Mercy. into the sanctuary, not on earth, but the sanctuary in heaven. Mm -hmm. And he is there now being a mediator mm. Mercy. for us. Mm. But what is he mediating? R remember now, remember what the pastor said. The pastor said earlier in his illustration that that which you had bought on credit had to be what? Repeat. Paid for. Mm -hmm. And now Jesus Christ is no longer, be this is no longer some figure that is being transaction that's going on where you're doing things on credit. He is there the true mediator in heaven, mm -hmm. and that what we're going to get and we're getting is eternal life. So what we see here happening when you read that verse, right, this, this, new, this new covenant, this is the real deal now. <laughs> this is no figure. This is no uh, 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 illustration of what is going to be. This is the real exact illustration of what is taking place, the actual transaction taking place. This is where money is being exchanged. Now, now in the, just an illustration, <laughs> where now uh, the blood is being exchanged now for you, your sin, for my sin, and, and for everyone who gives their lives over to him and confesses your sin. This is where the transaction is taking place, and this is where you now are being made a candidate, where you're getting your, 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 your entrance into the kingdom and you're getting eternal life. So what we're seeing here now, he, this, is the new, this is not necessarily a new covenant, but this is the perfect covenant mm -hmm. that is being now performed, mm -hmm. which is where Jesus is today, in the most holy place. And when you confess your sins, when you fall on your knees and you ask the Lord to forgive you, that high priest is no longer a, an earthly high priest, some man somewhere. It is Jesus Christ himself that says to his father, Father, my blood, my blood. And God says, I accept it mm. as payment for Crystal, for, for myself, for Pastor Brown, for anyone else, for their sins. Mm. And when he accepts it, God says, now cover him with your righteousness. Amen. <laughs> and when you're covered with Christ's righteousness, Satan cannot bring an accusation against you. Mm. He cannot. Because God says, the penalty has been paid for, and I'm the one who paid that penalty. Amen, amen. We're going to go to Thursdays, but before we do, with the passion of what you just shared, Elder Stewart, I'm wondering, how would someone not want this? Like, I think mm -hmm. about the text in Hebrews 2, verse 3. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect, if we neglect so, so great, great a salvation? A salvation? Mm -hmm. Pastor Brown, what would you say to the person who says, well, I don't need salvation. I'm okay. <laughs> what would you say to them? Ah. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Beloved, do, do you realize Satan works overtime to make us think uh -huh. that we are better off than we really are? Mm. It is his job to get us so deluded until, like um, the verse in Revelation says, you know, poor, blind, naked, and you, you just, you don't know it. You know, you don't know it. Folks, uh, Salvation is something that if we don't claim it, we are going to be pathetically sorry that we left that on the table. Mm -hmm. We've got to have it. We need it. We need it. We're all in bad shape, whether you realize it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not. We need what heaven is giving out. Go get yours, baby. Go get yours. 
Amen, amen, amen. In our last few moments, we're going to go on to Thursday's lesson. So again, we want to hear from you. Please send all of your questions and your comments to Sabbath School Table at Ephesus.org. And Thursday's lesson is entitled Heavenly Ministry. I want to read this text, Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, mm -hmm. now to appear in the presence of God for us. Mm -hmm. So, Elder Stewart, what is the significance of Jesus appearing in the presence of God for us? You and I cannot come before God to, as they say, educate our case, right? We can't do it. So you need, imagine you have committed the most heinous of crime and you are arrested, mm -hmm. taken to prison, and you decide that you are going to represent yourself, yeah. right? And I, I'm not a lawyer, but there's a saying, Pastor, you know the saying that a, 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 a person that represents, represents himself, himself as a fool for a client. As a fool for a client, right? Who represents himself. Now, there may be instances where that may not be true, but in this case, it is true, right? Yes. yes. Imagine that you now need a representative mm -hmm. to go before God because no sinner can come before God and live. Mm -hmm. And here you have someone who's going to come. The greatest defense attorney one could ever have mm -hmm. is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because not only can he give a good defense for you? He's also paid the price for you. So what happens is, is that it has been satisfied, those things that, 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 that have taken place. So Jesus Christ in ministry right now is in heaven, and he's saying to the Father every time someone comes, listen, the Father says, has said that your blood is sufficient to pay the, this, the, the, the price for every human being that has ever lived and will ever live and sin, because we're all born in sin anyway, mm -hmm. right? That your blood is, is more than sufficient to satisfy the claim of my law, mm -hmm. the claim of who I am, of who we are. And so now you have a mediator. And you know what the interesting thing about it is, brothers and sisters, is that not only is he your mediator, the one doing the um, uh, advocating on our behalf, He's also the one sitting behind as the judge. Mm. So when you have the court stacked in your favor, you know you can't lose. And like the pastor said, you know, if we can get stuck on stupid and don't accept something that's free, hmm. that you, not, you can't purchase, we, you know, there will be no excuse for anyone that is lost. Mm -hmm. And if I'm lost, I have no excuse. And if you're lost, you will have no excuse because you didn't have to do any great feat of, 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 right. of, 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 of something to prove that you, earn, you deserve it. Yeah. God says, all you got to do is have faith and accept it if you believe. Because what Abraham did, Abraham believed, and God says it was accounted to, to him for righteousness. righteousness. You do the same, and you'll have the same. Amen, amen. There's always so much you want to cover, but before we close... There's a question that I really want to address. I think it's important for us to make this really clear. This person is asking the question, Happy Sabbath, does the new covenant replace the old covenant? Can you break it down some more, please? And I know we've been discussing this old and new from last week to this week, and I think we can't move on unless we thoroughly understand. So Pastor Brown, can you just explain sure. in a very simple way sure. the new covenant, the old covenant, and does the new covenant replace the old covenant? Okay. It is a replacement in, in this respect, in this regard. You have Jesus himself writing on your heart what he wants you to do and how he wants you to live, as opposed to you stepping up and in your own strength saying, I got this, I got this. All that the Lord has said we will do, I'm good, I got this. So the idea of a replacement is that with better promises, and a better structure, that structure being Jesus himself, his blood, his sacrifice on your behalf, doing for you what you cannot do for yourself. That literally is what we are talking about. And that's why it's wrong for anybody to say that the new covenant 
removes the need to obey. Folks, if we could dispel obedience, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. The fact that obedience could not be treated as a, you know, take it or leave it option is why he had to die in the first place. So the, 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 the new covenant, the new covenant in no way and on no wise relieves us of the necessity to do what God has said to do. Amen. Anything you want to add to that, Elder Sturt, to bring more clarity? Um, what was the old covenant? What is the new covenant? Yeah, I, I would just say quickly, uh, God said to Moses, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. All right? And in that sanctuary, God gave specific instructions of what should be in there. And, and in, in the first compartment, the, the holy place, he tells what needs to be, table of showbread, the, the altar, mm -hmm. and, and, and then you had the veil to, in, to go into the most holy place, right? Among, and, and, and then in the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, you had the Ten Commandments. And above it is, is God's mercy seat, where he sits, right? So which says, that was signifying that uh, the Ten Commandments is a reflection of who I am and it's written on tables of stone. And, and, and that was the old covenant, and then you had to do the sacrificial system in, this, in the old sanctuary that was here on earth, right? Everything was pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything was pointing to who God is, the fact that his law was immutable. So now Jesus Christ comes now. There is no more earthly sanctuary. There is no two, ta two tables of stone with the, with that the fingers of God had written. And God says, I will no longer, you, don't, you no longer have to look at that commandment to remember to know who I am. I'm going to write the commandments in your heart. So that's where you, you I'm going to write it in your heart, right? And then he says that I am now, right, the sacrifice that was paid. So the new covenant is just the, is just the continuation of the, I mean, the old covenant is just a continuation of the old covenant, but now in a more perfect order. Right. So there is no such thing as an old way and a new way, right. an old way of salvation and a new way of salvation. It was the same way of salvation, except that now we're not going through this, the symbols mm -hmm. of it. We're going, Jesus Christ is coming, mm -hmm. died for us, and we're looking back at what he has done, and he said, I'll write my laws in your heart. And that's what he will do when you do that, if you'll obey him. Amen. So what I'm hearing both of you say, so Elder Stewart, you're explaining the sanctuary process mm -hmm. where they had to now go get a lamb, kill that lamb, you know, shed that blood, and the high priest was ministering on behalf of the people. And now because Jesus came and died for us, that no longer needs to take place. Right. Jesus has become that sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing you say, Pastor Brown, is because Jesus is now that sacrificial lamb doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we want to do. We still need to obey and be obedient to the covenant laws and practices. So with that, we are at our final minute of the Sabbath school table. And I want to read this statement from Thursday's, which I think is really powerful. It says, the great news of the new covenant is that now, because of Jesus, repentant sinners have someone representing them in heaven before the Father. So as we've learned today, Jesus became the substitute. He is the sacrifice. But more than just being the sacrifice, he's also our, our high priest. Mm -hmm. And even deeper to know that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So he actually knows what we're going through. Absolutely. And he's advocating on our behalf. Absolutely. So salvation is simple. You just need to trust God and accept this gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. So we thank you for joining us today on the Sabbath School table. I'm going to ask you, Pastor Brown, if you can pray for us to close. <laughs> Absolutely. And as I pray us out, I want to give you the first indication that the new quarterlies are available. Uh, members can stop by after church and during the week and get your new quarterly for the quarter that's coming soon. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf. I want to thank you that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And I'm asking that you would help us to appreciate your sacrifice enough to accept it to embrace it so that when you return in power and great glory, you can receive us unto yourself with all of the other redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you again for joining us. And remember, there's always a seat for you at the Sabbath school table. Have a blessed and a happy Sabbath.